On a mysterious planet, isolated from all other forms of life, there exists a cast of characters in a game show, competing in various challenges to win a prize. That prize? A wish for anything. Over the course of the episodes, the contestants would be eliminated one by one, with these contestants being personified objects. This is the premise of a brand new animated game show, called One. But while it may just look like yet another copy-pasted object show on the surface, once you actually start watching through the series episode by episode, there's a lot more to uncover about the world these episodes take place in. The series was started all the way back in June of 2020, and gradually had episodes releasing until August of 2022. The unique atmosphere of One is only reinforced by its original soundtrack, which sets a tone that deviates from the usual cheerful background music found in similar shows. This deliberate choice contributes to the series' feeling of unease, and helps to set it apart from the crowd. A vast change from the royalty-free background music most object shows opt into using. But to figure out what exactly makes One such a compelling series, we have to figure out what makes its genre so compelling in the first place. Object shows aren't the most easily accessible videos on the internet. The premise alone sounds like someone describing a drug trip. So then the leaf stole the island from the fire, and everyone chased her, so she jumped into a map and went to a place with berries that turn you to metal. How did we get here? This entire genre and community all revolve around the attention garnered by one series, Battle for Dream Island by Jack and Jellyfy commonly shortened to BFDI. With the first episode of the series, Take the Plunge, garnering over 66 million views to date, establishing the concept of an object show, a total drama-style animated survivor-esque game show where characters compete for a prize. Sounds familiar. But the most important part of an object show is, as you might guess, the fact that the characters are objects, with the losers of the challenge being up for elimination. The draw here is that the YouTube audience can choose a contestant to eliminate using the comment section, adding the audience interaction that makes series like this perfect for YouTube. Since then, people have either grown up continuing to watch them, or have no idea what's going on. While those that don't see the appeal just move on with their day, only ever watching a few of the more popular videos of this caliber, those who have stuck around with these shows formed an entire community, inspired to create their own object reality shows. And a large number of different series have come out of this, from parodies, like Object Show 87 or Battle for Circle, to other series with a similar level of quality to BFDI like Inanimate Insanity or Object Overload. However, it's important to note that these new series rarely ever leave the foundation BFDI set. Even though they follow the title of Object Show, it seems that younger creators focus more on the show part, the comment interaction, and game show formula. The first episode of One begins with an opening shot of San Francisco, and we follow Liam as he goes about his day, getting off work and taking his bike home only for him to vanish, not leaving a trace aside from his bike. So right away, one makes it abundantly clear that there's a more layered world than you might expect. This isn't anything new. Jack and Jellyfy occasionally releases videos in the BFDI universe that aren't tied to any challenges. So maybe it's just that. We cut to a child by the name of Charlie, playing with blocks, only for the baby's mother to pick him up and put him to bed. The child wakes up in an unfamiliar place, an area largely devoid of detail, with only shards of grass and light forest as far as the eye could see. Note how this area falls in line with the worlds of typical object shows, mostly being grassy plains. Speaking of, this area is called the Plain and it functions as the main location throughout the first half of the series. Charlie wasn't the only person to be teleported either. One by one, more and more people are brought to the plane. Taylor, Amelia, Bryce, Charlotte, and oh, there's Liam again. Just then, a disconnected voice, introducing itself as Aerie, begins explaining the world they're in, introducing them to his game show, called One. 
Understandably, the contestants aren't too fond of being forced to compete against each other for an undisclosed amount of time. And they're even less happy after Ares starts assigning them new names based on what object they are, stripping away their individualism and, ironically, objectifying the objects. All of these are staples of traditional object shows, but the difference that makes one special is how the characters react. In BFDI and Inanimate Insanity, the contestants are already named after their objects. They exist in these zany worlds where the creator can do anything, establish any set, and have the characters act in any way. One is already subverting this by treating the characters as if they were real people, unlike the surface level puppets or archetypes that other series follow. In a traditional object show, if you want a particular character to win or lose, just make them do something to heavily sway public opinion. This difference immediately makes it clear that one isn't just another object show. Of course, as that would be just another object show. The rest of the episode plays out similarly, introducing respawning, and, as these types of shows go, having a challenge. With the difference here being the amount of characters wanting to purposely lose in order to return to their daily lives, which regular object show characters wouldn't have. The first two people to fall are up for elimination, leaving the viewers deciding which contestant goes, Charlie or Liam. Remember what I said about rigged voting? Thinking about this rationally here, obviously those watching would be more inclined to vote at the baby character, especially when put next to Liam, the literal first character we meet. This vote is set up in a way for it to be as obvious as possible, in order to keep the true nature of the show hidden. The last thing we see in this episode is a tub of whipped cream disappearing from a grocery store. By next episode, the child is eliminated off screen. When asked how many people voted, Eri claims he didn't bother to count. Foreshadowing is a- and new characters begin entering the plane. But something about the new guys is different. These new characters weren't taken from this personified object world, but instead the real world, where objects are objects. These contestants act a lot more like the characters from your average object show. They're a lot more keen on playing the game, over the first group of contestants that have their own lives to live. Another challenge passes, Magazine is eliminated. In episode 3 we get our final round of new characters added. And while the first batch had objects playing the role of humans, and the second had objects in the role of objects, the third wave of new contestants is a slew of weird characters from all over the place. A literal atom, a text box, some computer assistant thing, abstract shapes, Circle from Cheesy HFJ's other series, Battle for Circle. Actually, I should talk about that. Battle for Circle started on November 26, 2018. Two years, two months, and 20 days before the first episode of One. The joke is that all of the characters are Circle. They compete for Circle. The host is Circle. The whole thing is meant to be a commentary on how most object shows are the same, represented by Circle. This specific circle, Circle with a Mole, actually came from BFC 11. This other series is definitely something important to look back to while going through his other one, as both contain satire and criticism of other, less thought out object shows. The second batch of contestants have a lot less personality than the first. Every member of the first group have a distinct personality. Bryce is short tempered and thalassophobic, Liam stays to himself. Charlotte's manipulative, Taylor is a teenager who gets easily frightened, and Amelia's a yoga instructor, making her a natural leader. Whippy Creamy is… nice, I guess. There just isn't the same amount of depth with these guys, much like the average object show characters, which tend to function as blank canvases. The new inclusions here are pretty creative, but the most important character here is Stone. He holds all the knowledge in the universe, but he's unable to express it since he doesn't have a mouth, and no one there understands sign language. An interesting take on the silent genius trope, and while it isn't at all important for the story, Stone's actually animated with the proper signing for ASL, or some other popular form of sign language. Excellent attention to detail in the animation. Stone quickly puts his powers to use by saving Soda Bottle from a falling cassette player, then putting the pieces inside of Backpack off screen 
With all the contestants on the plane, it's time to split into teams. Stone brings backpack, soda bottle, Texty, and himself together, driving a wedge between Senti and the rest of them. Stone's time on the show is incredibly short-lived, but during that time, he lays the groundwork for where everything eventually ends up. He forces Senti's team to win the challenge, leaving another team of misfits up for elimination. Abstracti is the one voted out, turning into a lamp-like figure before disappearing. Abstracti has a tendency to take the form of those around them, so it's clear that this lamp character will be important in the story. The next challenge is to draw in some sticky notes, the team with the worst drawings being up for elimination. Immediately, Stone begins writing strings of numbers on sticky notes and stuffing them inside of backpack. Because the notes are not visible, and with Airy not paying attention to where they ended up, Backpack's team ends up losing. But this time, Time, we see something a little different on the end card. Stone's eyes are glowing. The popular theory is that having eyes in the end screen shows a character is holding knowledge above everyone else, or having discovered some sort of truth. And since Stone does hold all the knowledge in the universe, it would make sense that he knows more about what's going on. Looking at the thumbnail for the episode, he has them there too, looking directly at the viewer. The episode is titled Walls, and it's the fourth episode of the series. In a post credit scene, Stone grabs the sticky notes and begins writing. He disappears as episode 4 ends with the haunting phrase, Votes are fake. You have no control. This takes us to why One works so well as a show. It breaks and subverts expectations by stripping away and altering the things that made object shows compelling in the first place. The same compelling elements that get so bogged down and repetitive over time as more and more shows do the same thing. The first episode of Battle for Dream Island is one of my earliest memories on the internet, and I know I became a fan of that because of the creativity within its world and interesting characters. But somewhere along the way, it seems that the focus for the majority of people went to the competition, as well as the voting system. Here, the competition is the least interesting part of the show, with more characters wanting to lose than to win. It's about the personalities of the characters and uncovering the ongoing mystery around their circumstances. The viewers don't have control over the outcome. In fact, the narrative was already set in stone before production even began, and it's been planned for a while. Seeing that Circle disappearing to join One happened all the way back in Battle for Circle 11, released on August 24th, 2019, well before the first episode of One. The game show aspects are a facade. As Stone said, the votes are fake, and with that revelation, the show begins to unravel. The next challenge is to do 100 push-ups. Backpacks and Senti's teams both don't do the challenge and are put up for elimination. On the end screen, Backpack and Soda Bottle both have the defined eyes Stone had prior to his elimination. This is because they were the ones who read his message. They know the truth. While Senti's team is happy to be put up for elimination, Backpack and Soda Bottle already know that the votes aren't real. Texty gets eliminated in the next episode, and in the next challenge, Backpack dies. He goes to this purgatory-like aether, which contains two chairs, a table, and a radio. There's also a toothpaste guy in a zombie-like state flipping through stations on a radio. The episode is titled La Salle de Tente, which translates from French to English as The Waiting Room, so that's what I'll call it going forward. Quickly enough, Backpack is brought back to life. When the outro appears, Backpack is the only one with the eyes, as he now knows more than those around him. The episode cuts off as Ares about to choose who gets eliminated. Okay. Further signifying what we already know. In the next episode, Backpack begins seeing visions of stone while holding a rock, and seeing his crumbling mental state, as well as what he's gone through over the course of the show, specifically dying, Senti chooses to win the challenge for her team, allowing Backpack to go home. Senti presumes that it's only been about four days since they've been brought there, but something else is going on here. Halfway through the conversation, Backpack loses the highlighted eyes. I doubt he forgot about the waiting room. My guess would be this happened because he's no longer thinking about it. Since whenever we see the eyes, the characters are actively thinking about what they just learned. Or, alternatively, by having this conversation, Backpack's thinking optimistically about the real world, while ignoring the problem. And, as the saying goes, ignorance is bliss. Which is severing his connection to the plane, and, by extension, the solution to this mystery. 
Lastly, if the eyes mean truth rather than knowledge, then maybe the eyes disappearing just shows that what he's saying isn't true. The show purposely keeps these aspects vague, so I guess each viewer has to decide the meaning for themselves. The next episode begins with Aerie preparing for the elimination. However, you can hear him stepping on something and going down with a crash. <laughs> this proves that Airy is not in fact the air around them like his name implies, but is instead an actual person somewhere talking to the contestants remotely. With Airy gone, Backpack just starts walking, finding a large pillar in the ground that, when zoomed out, appears to be a giant plug, revealing that the world they're in, the plane, isn't real, instead being some sort of false reality or matrix. For the next seven months, the objects just had to live normally in the world they're stuck in, building structures around them and setting up a shift system to keep track of time. But eventually, Airy comes back, and right as he's content with everything around him, Backpack is eliminated. This is the exact moment the show foregoes any aspect of a traditional object show. At this point, the only thing in common with something like BFDI is that the characters are objects. So instead of focusing any more attention on the competition laying out breadcrumbs, we need to follow them. Upon returning to Earth, Liam discovers that he'd been missing for about seven months and is presumed dead. He walks around San Francisco and ends up studying the notes Stone gave him in an alleyway. One of those notes contains an address to an apartment in Bridgeport, Connecticut, the same place Bryce told him he was from at the beginning of the show. Where do you live, by the way? Bridgeport, what about you? This concludes the first half of the series, dubbed as the first season as the episodes going forward all but completely break away from the object show format. The first half of the show established everything we needed to piece this mystery together, and it's up to the second half to take us on that journey. And just as importantly, show off the dynamic between the team Stone put together earlier, Liam, Bryce, and Texty. But most importantly, the first two. Now, I think it's important to mention when talking about the relationship between these characters that the community really likes shipping them. Now that you have that permanently scarred into your brain, the dynamic between Liam and Bryce doesn't work because they have chemistry, it works specifically because they don't. At this point, Bryce has only spent about a week in the competition, which has reinvigorated him to actually appreciate his life to the fullest. The show gave Bryce a new sense of purpose, and ultimately, made his life better in the long run. Liam, on the other hand, spent seven full months there, his ties to the real world all but completely severed, with his job, living space, and belongings gone as he's presumed dead. Liam has nothing to lose, while Bryce has no reason to throw everything he has away, only moving forward because Liam's pushing him to. And he's also somewhat driven to save the others. Taking from where we left off, episode 10 follows Liam using the notes to meet up with Bryce. While Liam is hard set on getting answers, Bryce is a lot less involved with the whole thing, willing to just move on and forget it. After some convincing, Liam is allowed into Bryce's apartment. One of the notes takes them to a yard sale where they buy a laptop. The reason it was being sold was because the text boxes wouldn't work, but when they brought it back home, it worked just fine. As it turns out, that laptop is the one Texty comes from, meaning Stone brought them together knowing that they'd all meet up again. Texty being brought to the plane is also the reason for the laptop being sold, as without a text box, the computer wouldn't type. Texty was eliminated much earlier on, meaning they had more time to research the game show, finding a strange database with information on all the contestants, featuring images taken by some stalker, some with personal photos, some taken in public, Bryce's while he was sleeping, and cropping up other characters the contestants appear in photos with. There were even pages for other groups, most importantly, the website URL says Season 2, meaning the game was held once before. A number of contestants from the first season don't have a placement listed, which all lines up as one of the Season 1 contestants happens to be the toothpaste seen in the waiting room, whose real name is Julien Beaumont. Using the website, they learn that one of the Season 1 contestants lives in New York, so they find him in a homeless shelter and look for answers. This calculator man, named Oscar, explains that he remembered his time on the show, explaining it as a weird dream he had 10 years ago. This means Julien was stuck on that chair flipping through radio stations for a full decade. Unfortunately, Oscar knows nothing about the notes. The conversation doesn't get them anywhere. 
until they start to head back, and Liam's eyes become stylized as he comes to an epiphany. The numbers may have something to do with the radio he saw when he visited the waiting room, but to get there, you have to die. That night, a storm's coming in, directly corresponding to one of the nodes. Liam thinks they need to go to a specific section of a nearby power plant. Bryce would rather just give up and move on, to continue living his life instead of trespassing onto private property. They have an argument as Liam starts heading towards the plant. During the argument, Liam calls Bryce Soda Bottle, while Bryce calls him Liam. I'm dead to this world, Soda Bottle! Don't you get it? Liam! Highlighting how Liam is more connected with his life on the plane, not moving on like Bryce has. Liam climbs the ladder on the power plant anyways, and Bryce follows. He asks for his car keys back, and only then does lightning strike, giving both of them the eyes, but ultimately killing them both. This makes sense with knowledge theory, since Liam and the notes were proven right, educating Bryce and bringing him up to speed. They both appear in the waiting room, but Toothpaste isn't there. This could mean that there are multiple waiting rooms, or that Toothpaste only appears when he and Liam are alone. The waiting room looks different for every person that enters. While this empty area is the default, people usually see a specialized place. For Bryce, it's the suburbs he grew up in. And for Texty, it's a weird internet dog room with froggy chairs. The only constant is that there are chairs and a radio. And people that see something also see a loved one enticing them towards the other side. This confirms that the waiting room is in fact some sort of purgatory. A gateway leading the dead to the other side. The three try to follow the notes to Stone using the radio, with the numbers on the sticky note being his dimension number on the radio. But it doesn't take them anywhere, as they kept entering it wrong and going to many different universes, showcasing a fun variety of animation styles. Once they finally did make it there, it was just a dark planet covered in stones. When they leave at the end of the episode, the stones all had eyes. This could mean a lot of different things. Do all stones know everything? Are they a hive mind and all they need to do is pick one up? Maybe the other little stones know where our stone is. With the eyes highlighting the knowledge they hold over our main characters, there's no real way to tell. Luckily, Taxi discovers kill commands to send them back to purgatory without having to die painfully, so they go back. Not having made any progress, Liam begins to lose hope, but at the same time, Bryce is the opposite. The discovery of the radio corresponding to the notes opened the doors for them to try out the rest of them. And right as Bryce finally joins Liam in working on the mystery, he no longer sees the suburbs in purgatory. His connection with reality severed as he too gets more involved with looking for answers. They learn that the note titled SF are the coordinates for San Francisco, so they go back to Earth to get a charger for the laptop text he resides in. They're about to head back to the waiting room when Bryce vanishes early forced back into rejoining the game. As he appears there in the next episode, the eyes vanish from his silhouette. Notice that when he disappears, Liam calls him Bryce, while Senti calls him Soda Bottle when he does appear, with her months of living in the plane being her new normal. Just like Liam did in the argument earlier. But as Liam's grown to disconnect from the identities on the plane, Senti has completely adopted it as a way of life. Going by knowledge theory, the highlighted eyes vanishing might mean that he doesn't know what's going on. He's out of the loop compared to everyone else who spent all that time there. Alternatively, it could mean that by being brought back into the competition, he's pulled away from solving the mystery. He's not progressing by being sent back, so the eyes are gone. He went from Soda Bottle to Bryce, and now back to Soda Bottle. Liam checks the website and he learns that Bryce was put back into the show. And a little while later, he encounters Toothpaste, who we now know is named Zhu Young. Liam uses the notes to take him back to Earth, freeing the soul of one of Aerie's first victims. This makes Liam more driven than ever to put an end to the show once and for all. Furious, he follows the note to Aerie. Keep in mind, this is the psychopath that heartlessly forces living objects to compete in competitions for months on end, with no empathy for their suffering. Thus far, he's been presented as some omnipresent god, a bit unprofessional, but a sadist who has the power to do anything. And he's actually just some guy on a computer. This is Aerie's true form, the same figure that Abstract he was morphing into when they were eliminated with the crack coming from the fall that left him out of commission for seven months. 
When Liam meets him, he isn't particularly hostile, evil, or vindictive. He's just lonely and isolated from all other people. Eri doesn't even recognize that he's putting these real people through intense trauma and pain. All of his years in isolation slowly tearing away at his socialization skills and empathy. But even though he isn't some cartoonish monster, he's still done horrible things. Liam's life has been totally ruined, as well as the lives of many others. But Eri doesn't see that. He just sees what the viewers see when watching an object show. Personified objects competing in challenges to win a prize. Liam has a burning hatred for Eri and everything he did to both him and the other unwilling contestants, but the feeling isn't mutual in the slightest. And besides, even though he wants to, Liam wouldn't be able to kill him anyways. He's the only one who knows how to use the computer to bring his friends back. He goes out to get reads and Liam follows, curious about the show when still seeking answers. There, they make an agreement that Eri will bring the contestants home in exchange for the pieces of his cassette player he broke way earlier in the show, that Liam just so happened to have. They both agree. However, on the way back, Liam slips on the bridge above the waterfall, losing the notes and Texty's charger. He's stranded there, for good. Later that night, Liam asks about the first show. It turns out that he didn't know how to safely bring objects there. After the first challenge and Oscar was sent home, he accidentally dropped a rock on the planet without scaling it down, killing the remaining contestants and ending the show early. Since then, he's been gradually improving his computer skills, learning how to revive people and, according to him, doing a generally better job, besides the part where he ruins their lives. Basically, Eri is the average object show creator. A bit unconfident in their abilities, ending their series early as they lose the passion to work on them. The difference obviously being that Ares game hurts the people that play it, while in real life, the characters are just that, characters. When Ares out getting wood one day, Liam checks on the computer and realizes that Ares planning to create another season of one after he lets his current contestants go. This drives Liam to attempt to murder Ares and put an end to the show for good. The scene was very well executed. There's no dramatic music or extra focus on it. The characters just have this awkward silence as Liam finally completely loses it. However, the attempt doesn't work, ending in a tree falling on Liam crushing his leg, just like what happened back when he was stuck on the plane. And even then, Eri shows him hospitality, even giving him the same type of crudely put together cast that he made before. However, one day, when he's gathering supplies, Eri falls and lands on a sharp rock, killing him instantly. It isn't the super dramatic final battle, and it isn't even Liam murdering him. He just happened to die in some freak accident. Liam's given everything he had to put an end to the show, and now he finally did it. Not through killing him directly, but by some unlikely accident. Liam got exactly what he wanted. No more people will be harmed, at the cost of those who are already there, those who will be there forever. The final moment of the show is a flashback montage of Ares' backstory. His original death, finding the planet, creating the plane, and bringing the first contestant there, then picking up with the direct aftermath, with the fates of the characters being uncertain. The ending one goes for isn't the happiest, and it isn't the easiest to watch after you get attached to the characters, but it's probably the most realistic outcome. This entire journey always felt like it was against the odds. Just three characters trying to navigate purgatory with a handful of sticky notes written in a couple minutes, trying to save the remaining contestants. But in all likelihood, that's probably not going to happen. The computer's complicated and will take a long time for Liam to learn. This means that Charlotte's guaranteed to die as the mold infection spreads, eating her alive. Earlier on, we learned that respawning the characters sets them back to how they were when they first entered the plane, so maybe they can be recovered in time. Either way, in order for them to be sent home, Liam would need to learn how to respawn characters, figure out which dimensions each of the characters are from, and figure out how to teleport which characters where. And by the time he learns that, would they even want to be brought back? Liam had only spent seven months on the plane, and by the time he came back, he had already been presumed dead and lost everything. Who's to say they wouldn't rather stay with the people around them over the worlds that left them behind? And here lies the hopeless reality the characters are trapped in. A lose-lose scenario where no one gets out unscathed. Another possibility is that the ending is in reference to those who cancelled their own shows early, leading to a number of dead ends. 
Making a series takes a lot of hard work, and sometimes things just don't work out in the end. Let's look back to BFDI. After the conclusion of the first season, Jack and Jellify released the first episode of a new, bigger series, Battle for Dream Island Again. And while each of the episodes were very positively received, the motivation to continue working on such a grandiose project became overwhelming, with the series only lasting six episodes before being shelved in place of a one-off called IDFB, and ultimately the true follow-up, BFB. Battle for Battle for Dream Island, which itself was split into two, with BFB skipping a ton of eliminations and ending early, and the power of two, or Teapot, being the new long-running series. The only thing separating BFDIA from every other cancelled series is the fact that BFDIA 6 actually did release 10 years later, but the same can't be said for all the others. While Battle for Circle was a parody of object shows, one is a subversion of object shows. Battle for Circle pointed out that every object show is the same, then one delivered how to make something different, with its own style, character, and story, diving into elements of object shows that most people just accept, like, what do the characters do when the episode ends? Why is the area around the characters so empty and simple? And what happens when you put objects that aren't used to being alive, versus objects that have always been alive? It's a series that exists for more than just a community-voted game show. It has a story to tell and a point to make. One goes against a lot of the reasons BFDI worked. The challenges aren't interesting. The viewers have no control. The objects bicker and argue constantly. But for a show like One, it all works. Instead of being an object show, it's an object show. Following the object characters, rather than the strict and limited format they're often forced to reside in. The world of One is by all intents and purposes, a hopeless reality. But the show itself proves that the genre is not, keeping the spirit of old object shows alive while pushing the medium forward. So, is One a one-off, or a new beginning? Will it always just be this cool, subversive story and critique on the simplicity of object shows, or will it go on to inspire new object show creators to add some more depth to their worlds? Well, by all intents and purposes, it seems like it already has. Six months ago, YouTube user Lilac's Drawings released episode 1 of Help Hotline, a series that's Jack and Jellify inspired without following the game show format or even using objects. And while it very well could have been in the works on its own, going to earlier videos on their channel, it's clear that they're, at very least, a fan of one.